Alrighty, okay, it is 10 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Every time I do a new class in for the semester, it's all about sort of finagling with this stuff till I get it right. Okay, so um, got a couple questions over the weekend about perusal. I haven't had a chance to touch it yet, but I'll go back in and look at it. Um, if anyone does have any questions and things like that. Um, but basically for perusal, make comments as you go through the reading. It's basically like taking notes, but your classmates can also see them and interact with you. So um, I will keep you up to date on that. As with everything else for this class, um, you have until the end of class to do all the perusals too. Again, I wouldn't recommend trying to save them all for the end because then you're reading the entire textbook plus, right? In <laughs> like the last couple of weeks. But if this first one, you're still trying to get your feet under you, you know, totally cool to turn it in sometime this week. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take attendance. I'm going to do this out loud a couple times. And if I butcher my, your name, correct me. Um, and hopefully by like the week after next, I'll be able to just check you off as you come in. Uh, but right now I want to make sure that I actually have your names right know that you're here. And again, those of you I've had before, thank you for your patience with me in advance. All right, Amia. All righty. Kaylin, I saw. Ella? Okay. And then Emily. And Caitlin. Abby? Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> I'm also vertically challenged, as you can see, so I might have to do this sometimes. All right, Lauren, okay. Elijah, I do not see. Um, also in psych classes, I will learn the guys' names faster just because there are fewer of them. I know that's not very feminist to me, but it's how my brain works, so I apologize. All right, um, Ayanna Jones, all right. Lucia? Aisha, okay. Stupid font. I'm writing it out for myself in basically serif font. Okay. <laughs> uh, Deshaun? Naya, I saw. And Olivia, I saw. Rowan? Daryl? Daryl, yet today. Uh, Gabriella? Did you prefer Gabriella or Gabby? It doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> All right, Connor, and then Emma, okay, and Jordan. Ooh, ooh, ooh. All righty. So we had been talking about, oh, and just thanks to the advance for filling out those questionnaires on Friday. It really helps our department to be able to chart your birth over the course of your major. Um, so, but we have been talking about, uh, sort of why scientific literacy is important beyond just psychology or other sciences. And so I thought that this one was really interesting. 
Oh, I just realized we have two layers of captions. Hang on just a sec here. Let me go ahead and turn off the Zoom ones. Just because the Google ones are very slightly better. Um, and this bit short video I thought was really interesting in terms of thinking about the larger implications of a, what we would consider like a biological or medical event with COVID. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and play this for y'all. Let me just start with my thoughts and prayers to those who are stricken with the virus and to those that have lost loved ones. I recognize we're talking about supply chain here, but there really is a human tragedy at hand. 94% of the Fortune 1000 are seeing major disruptions. That's Fortune magazine. 14% of the facilities that make active pharmaceutical ingredients are in China, raising fears of drug disruptions here in the US. That's the Washington Post. Oxford Economics, they estimate the spread of the virus could knock 1.3% off of global growth this year, or more than a trillion dollar economic impact. Now, an important item here from a supply chain perspective is that through the chaos of recovery, it's going to be very easy to overlook the root cause and gaps within the supply chain that may have paralyzed the business during this event in the first place. So building toward a resilient supply chain will be at the epicenter of future discussions for years to come. But COVID-19 is only the latest in an increasing number of unexpected disruptions that have been hitting supply chains. Consider the earthquake in Japan, uh, estimated $210 billion economic impact. And that was in 2011 and is still having ramifications. Again, if you follow the news, um, they're just now figuring out how to dispose of the wastewater related to this. So if you guys don't remember, there was a tsunami that caused an earthquake, that caused a nuclear meltdown at one of their nuclear power plants. And so they're actually processing, diluting, filtering, and releasing the wastewater. Um, and a lot of people are protesting it. I do have inside information here. Uh, my husband works, uh, well, now he teaches, but prior to that, he worked on the reactors on submarines at the shipyard. Um, so he has essentially, without a degree, like a master's level understanding of nuclear physics. And when I asked him about it and I, he was like, what, I haven't heard about this. And he read it, he was like, no, that's actually fine. I can understand why people are upset, but no, that's actually fine. And I remember a friend of ours who was a submariner in the Navy, uh, which was hilarious to me because if you've ever seen or been on one of the subs, they're very small, very cramped. And he was like six two. So I don't know how he fit, um, but he said they had a similar thing at one point where people were like, oh, you're dumping your wastewater. That's potentially dangerous. And one of his commanders came into a meeting with an armload of bananas and put it on the table and said, that's how much potassium is being released when we do that. Um, so again, we shouldn't really make light of things like nuclear power and but there are ways to do it safely. And I think because of things like the meltdown here, Chernobyl, right? People think nuclear equals bad. Um, and there are ways to do it safely. In cases like Chernobyl, if anyone watched the miniseries, um, what happened happened because they made a bunch of stupid decisions, right? If you do things correctly, you will see them actually done correctly. So just wanted to kind of point out that these things have lasting effects. Or the civil unrest at a copper mine in Chile, where the global copper capacity was reduced by 5%. Or the cyber attacks, the WannaCry attack, it's estimated losses could reach 4 billion. Or crop disease, dry weather, and government policy changes that caused cocoa shortage. Uh, for was anyone here, probably not since this is a 200 level class, but was anyone here in at Wesleyan in fall of 2019? Probably not. Well, in fall of 2019, we got hit with a ransomware attack, which was lovely. Uh, we call it the other virus because it was about three months before COVID really became a thing. 
Um, and like to this day, there are repercussions for it. So I am serving on our committee for advancement and tenure, where the people who review people's files and uh, help make decisions as to whether they should be promoted or not. And from that ransomware attack, there is still data, like Dean's evaluations of these people we cannot recover. Um, and again, that was like four years ago now. So these things have long lasting effects, right? But if you don't think about how's that gonna affect things, right? Then you could just be like, why would COVID affect global shipping? Global food manufacturers. So the list goes on. But the bottom line here is that COVID-19 is just one event in an increasing number of disruptions. There really is a new normal here. And this that sentence that there's kind of a new normal relates to what I talked about when I talked about my addressing model in terms of my generation having been through just a whole bunch of stuff, right? The housing bubble, the Great Recession, uh, COVID, all of these natural disasters, right? Um, and so again, unfortunately, y'all are not gonna be immune either. Uh, then do this. All right, so the next thing and gosh, okay, hang on just a sec. It's so weird because like these things will work just fine on YouTube and then like the links aren't working. So, all righty. The next thing we're gonna start talking about and thinking about is thinking like a scientist. Hmm. And as I pull this up, I want to fully acknowledge we do not want his master class we have to pay for. Um, I might not be able to find it because they might have put it by that find a paywall. That's why. Um, but essentially, what he talks about is um, the ways that we can change our minds the ways that we can look at science. And again, I want to fully acknowledge that he himself can be problematic. He has had allegations of sexual harassment brought against him. So just sort of like, we always need to keep in mind who we're looking at as well. And, you know, who is this person? Um, in my assessment of individual differences course, one of the things we did, and now it's just stuck. There we go. One of the things we did on Thursday was to look at the history of assessment in psychology, for example. And it's like, yay, this guy came up with the correlation coefficient. That allows us to do a lot of research we still do today. Boo, he was a eugenicist, right? And so we need to acknowledge these things. We need to look at our racist history. So as you get further in your psychology major, you will reach higher and need to have higher and higher levels of scientific literacy. You'll need to look at things critically. Um, and this is a skill that you're trained on. So in graduate school, one of the things my advisor would do is bring in um, articles or manuscripts that were submitted uh, for her to review as a peer reviewer for publication. She wouldn't like use our comments of what she did, but she was trying to train us. How do you critically look at other people's work? And she would always be like, I'm glad you guys aren't my reviewer. You're a little too harsh, right? Um, but the idea that this is a really important skill to analyze the existing research, to analyze our own research and say, where did I F up, <laughs> right? Why didn't this work? Um, so I think we've established psychology is a science, but what do you all think? What makes psychology a science? Yeah. Yeah, it can be changes and moves with the times. I mean, psychology is a very young science. The first psych lab was really only established in 1873, I think. That sounds like a while ago, but if you think about like bio and pen having roots in the like Renaissance, right? It's really kind of short. Yeah, so we adapt. Yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah. So we study things. We set up experiments or we do surveys um, to study what people are doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think in a lot of places, or just for a lot of people, that's easier to understand as a science, right? That, okay, we talk about the brain, the brain is biology, right? I remember seeing when I was an undergrad, this cartoon that was like, well, psychology is basically biology, and biology is basically chemistry, and chemistry is basically physics, and physics is basically math, right? Um, and so it was just like, all these sciences are interrelated. I'm wearing a skirt with brain scans on it today, right? Like we think of that as very scientific. But yeah, just like we've been saying here, what makes it a science isn't that we deal with these biological things, it's um, that we test things, that we use the scientific method. Uh, so a bleepity bleep, sorry. <laughs> At least I can prevent myself from actually swearing. Uh, there we go. At least this one I can find. Meet Grammarly Go. Your go-to solution for getting quality work done quickly. Hello and welcome to SciShow Psych. I am Hank Green, one of your hosts, and twice a week we will be here exploring the science of what makes humans tick. That's right, I said it, psychology is a science. People have been debating this pretty much since psychology started back in the 1800s. You can sort of see why people might think psychology doesn't count as a science. The study of the human mind is often missing the tightly controlled experimental conditions and conclusive results that you'll find in other fields like astronomy or chemistry. And yeah, psychology research can be tricky because brains are complicated, but it's still a science. Now, defining science is surprisingly hard because there's no standard definition everyone agrees on. But most people would probably agree with this. Science is systematically observing natural events, then using those observations to develop laws and principles. Then those principles are tested through the scientific method, that list of steps you probably learned in your first science class, observation, hypothesis, experimentation, analysis, and conclusion. Still, these are really just basic guidelines, and most branches of science will operate a little differently from one another. Like, particle physicists can't directly observe the Higgs boson. Instead, they rely on statistics to know it's there. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist or that physics isn't actually science. The so-called rules of science all depend on the type of work a scientist is doing, and psychology is no exception. Psychology is the study of the human mind and behavior, and there are lots of different ways to do that. But any good psychologist can demonstrate that their research follows the scientific method just like biology or chemistry. After observing patterns in human behavior, psychologists usually develop a specific testable hypothesis about why that behavior happens, or they might create a scenario and see if it leads to certain behaviors. Then, if they want to find correlation between variables that a certain event and behavior are related, they'll conduct a field experiment where they carefully observe subjects in normal, uncontrolled circumstances. Or if they want to determine causation, whether or not a certain event actually triggers... And just really quickly, yes, you can actually do field experiments and observe people, um, but you can observe people just as accurately by giving them surveys to fill up. So that in and of itself is another type of observation and where we use correlation. Triggers a behavior, they'll create a rigorous, highly controlled and replicable laboratory experiment. Next, they'll use statistics to analyze relationships within those data and to make sure the findings are reliable. The experiments are often repeated under the same conditions. Sounds a lot like science, right? People who don't believe psychology is a science will usually say that psychology isn't rigorous enough, that data are often inconclusive or can be interpreted in too many ways. They might also argue that the definitions in psychology are too abstract to be accurately tested. For example, how do you define happiness? People define it differently depending on their culture, their circumstances, or even what day it is. So how can researchers objectively define it? Also, how can you objectively measure or quantify something as abstract as happiness? Another argument is that the results in psychology can't be reliably reproduced because people change every day. But psychologists account for those things. Like, even though you can't directly measure abstract concepts like happiness or anger, psychologists operationalize them, meaning they create, validate, and test a function 
functional definition that serves as a good substitute for something abstract. Going back to our happiness example, they might study it by tracking how often a person smiles or laughs. Or they could have people rate their happiness on a scale from 1 to 10, or track the amount of endorphins in their system. All of these are useful for different reasons and offer- And a lot of psychological studies now will do multiple of those, where like, let's say you're doing an experiment where you're going to see if I show someone this goofy clip from our cartoon, are they going to smile more? You might also uh, collect biological samples. So for example, in studies where the people who are stressed might be involved, you can have people just sort of like, I mean, it's not scientifically correct to say chew on, but put cotton balls in their mouth, test those, and get their levels of cortisol, which is a stress hormone for valid, valuable data. Also, a lot of arguments against psychology missed the whole point of the field. Psychology isn't looking to capture a universal human experience, because that doesn't exist. Humans are messy. You're influenced by so many things, from your culture to your circumstances, and even that book you read all the time back as a kid. Creating broad, strict rules for human behavior would miss a lot of the nuance and detail found in different people and situations. So as long as researchers acknowledge that their work is limited by the differences between people and take that into account in their analyses and conclusions, it's not an issue. At the end of the day, psychology is a science, just like biology or chemistry or particle physics. But there is plenty of pseudoscience out there, self-help books and advice columns and websites that make claims about psychology that are totally false, and it can be hard to separate fact from fiction. And that is part of why we're starting this show. Humans who's going to go more into why they did Psycho Psych. Um, highly recommended, great series. Um, and hankering is fabulous. Uh, so yeah, the idea that yes, we're studying people, we're studying mostly human behavior, um, but that that we're never trying to say all people act this way, right? We're trying to look at individual differences, right? So like, just give you an example from my own research. I look at risk factors for developing body image disturbance, feeling bad about how you look. Well, one of the things I'm interested in is if you're like higher on one of these risk factors, does that make it more likely you'll develop body image dissatisfaction? So you can't just say everybody's higher on this, right? Or you can't look at those differences. Um, or what I've been doing recently is looking in a more nuanced way. So this summer I collected data on trans and non-binary individuals, and I'm gonna look at things like gender dysphoria. And does that relate to how you feel about your body. I mean, I'm guessing yes, right? There's my hypothesis, but I haven't had a chance to analyze the data yet. So they've done studies and about a quarter of Americans are scientifically illiterate. And that's an improvement, woohoo! Because they used to only be 10%. Um, but just thinking about your science education, whether if you're at Wesleyan, in high school, middle school, what have you. What's your opinion or your experience of what the state of science education is like in the US, or at least where you were? I'll start y'all out with an example. Um, my high school chemistry, they did not have good facilities. So we did like two experiments all year. And then I got to college and my first day in intro chem, they're like, fake aspirin. <laughs> and I was like, excuse me? Like, I don't even know what half this equipment is. Right, so I was clearly underprepared, partially because of a lack of funding and specific facilities. Y'all have experiences like that? Yeah, no. My high school demographic is mostly Hispanic and Latinx, so we have a lot of access to materials. So I would say that the education that we have was great as the education has in the Long Island, and some of the other things, like for example, the fact as well. It definitely does differ in that respect. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, does anyone know what school funding is tied to? Property taxes. Yeah, property taxes, right? So if you live in an area with more tons of property, you're going to have more funding for your school. 
Yeah, that's such a good and thank you for acknowledging that privilege. I think that's really important. And even within places where there might not be as great of resources, a lot of places will create full high schools or um, programs within high schools, right, to emphasize things like the sciences. So Bayside, right up the street, uh, their home to Virginia Beach's health sciences school. So people interested in maybe becoming doctors, uh, even people interested in psychology might sort of gravitate towards that. Um, I grew up in the Detroit area. I was definitely in the suburbs. I was definitely in one of those places where we had more funding. I was probably like, oh, perfect. Um, but like in downtown Detroit, they created these sort of magnet schools where like one was all for the arts and one was all for the sciences, right? So you can get that education. But yeah, I think what we've really pointed out is it might vary dramatically, right? Uh, there's a high school that has their own aquarium. <laughs> Right. I like follow them on Instagram because I'm just dumbfounded by this. Um, you know, so it depends on funding. It depends on where the funding is prioritized as well. Right. Uh, even here at Wesleyan, this building, this space we're in right now, the social science lab, my first couple of years here, this was completely renovated, which is great. And we have some great facilities on the other side of the wall. There's a computer lab. There's one of those interview and observation rooms with the one-way mirror and things like that. Um, but then like, we haven't done anything else for social sciences since. And meanwhile, and I do not begrudge them this because I'm very happy we are support for the natural sciences, but we have career and we have lots of different, uh, you know, improvements and renovations for the natural sciences. So it's where you choose to focus your energy and your money. All right, and so this is how the U.S. compares to other countries on uh, science, math, and reading scores. And so uh, this is where our score, anyone sort of in this range is not significantly different from us. Anyone who's in yellow is significantly lower than us. Anyone who's in this dark blue uh, scores significantly higher than us. So we're in the same range as some countries you would expect, right? Denmark, Belgium, Norway, France, a bunch of other westernized countries uh, for things like science. Mathematics, we don't do quite as well. You can see we're down here. And reading, so same thing. We're seeing Denmark, we're seeing Sweden, the UK. Um, and then the places that are higher up are places like Singapore, Japan, uh, but then maybe some places you might not expect. So Estonia, Macau, um, Slovenia, right? And so again, it all depends on sort of where things are prioritized and where funding is prioritized. And one of the things I'm noticing is you know, places like Singapore, like Hong Kong, and like Finland come up over and over. And those are places that put a lot of their resources into education. So in Finland, teachers are probably paid about what I'm paid as a professor, right? Um, and they do a lot of work around the best way for kids to learn and supporting teachers and helping kids learn. And meanwhile, I don't know if anyone else has friends who are teachers, but right now in the US, a lot of people are stopping being teachers because they have the opposite of that support. Like not only in terms of funding, right? lack of planning period because you've got to cover for a teacher to have quit. Um, but also in some places being told what they can and can't teach, right? Uh, so that also is gonna feel invalidating. So a part of it is where we put our resources and also the methods we use to teach. So when you think about a scientist, who do you envision? What do you envision them doing? Yeah. Yeah, 
conducting some studies, maybe peering into a microscope. Right, this is a silly kind of stereotype cartoonish, right? But we often think of sort of an Einstein looking person. I haven't seen Oppenheimer, but apparently the ways that Einstein appears are almost needed. Like one way just pops up from behind a car. Sorry, mine's much. Um, but this is sort of the indelible image of a scientist in, I think, our popular culture. So then that translates for some people. But yeah, really what they're doing is doing experiments, exactly like you just said, right? And they're doing it in lots of different ways. So yeah, you've got people who look like Einstein peering into microscopes, right? But you also have people working one-on-one -on -one doing brain scans with kiddos. Uh, this is one of the scientists who uh, helped create the technique they used to get the first picture of a black hole. Um, these are scientists doing some archaeology or geology. Uh, these are social sciences gathering information. Uh, this is from the famous doll study by Mamie Tip Tips Clark and her husband Kenneth Clark, uh, where they showed black children, white and black dolls, and said which one's prettier, which one's smarter, and the kids kept saying the white doll, the white doll. And they wrote up an anarchist brief based on this research. And that was part of why the decision went the way it did in the Brown versus Board of Education case in the Supreme Court, which helped to integrate schools. And yes, we are using high sensory equipment, right? But sometimes we're just kind of using ourselves. So there's lots of different ways to do science. Uh, one of the things that's most hilarious to scientists is in disaster movies, when like a problem comes up and you've got a biologist they're like, oh my gosh, this asteroid is coming in. Magically, the biologist can like do all the calculations for the asteroid. And it's like, not that the biologist isn't smart and couldn't figure that out, but like our specialities within science are so tight. And so um, one of the best analogies I've seen for like your dissertation, for example, is like if all of science was a big circle your dissertation is like a little tiny bubble coming off the side to add to it, right? So like the idea that, you know, a scientist could just do any type of science is unfortunately not true. But the beautiful thing is that we have so many different people who are scientists and who often collaborate together. There's a lot of interdisciplinary science that goes on now. Hey, this one worked. Um, one of the things that came up in the past five, six years is that uh, people worry that in science and perhaps in psychology in particular, there's what they call a reproducibility crisis that we can't find the same results someone else found. And so this is a brief video that's gonna talk about that. In 2011, a team of physicists reported a startling discovery. Neutrinos traveled faster than the speed of light by 60 billionths of a second in their 730 kilometer trip from Geneva to a detector in Italy. Despite six months of double checking, the bizarre discovery refused to yield. But rather than celebrating a physics revolution, the researchers published a cautious paper arguing for continued research in an effort to explain the observed anomaly. In time, the error was tracked to a single incorrectly connected fiber optic cable this example reminds us that real science is more than static textbooks. Instead, researchers around the world are continuously publishing their latest discoveries, with each paper adding to the scientific conversation. Published studies can motivate future research, inspire new products, and inform government policy. So it's important that we have confidence in the published results. If their conclusions are wrong, we risk time, resources, and even our health in the pursuit of false leads. When findings are significant, they are frequently double-checked by other researchers, either by reanalyzing the data or by redoing the entire experiment. For example, it took repeated investigation of the CERN data before the timing error was tracked down. Unfortunately, there are currently neither the resources nor professional incentives to double-check the more than one million scientific papers published annually. Even when papers are challenged, the results are not reassuring. 
Recent studies that examined dozens of published pharmaceutical papers managed to replicate the results of less than 25% of them, and similar results have been found in other scientific disciplines. Yeah, so it came out, I want to say, it's actually longer than five years ago now, though, that I'm thinking about maybe like 2015, somewhere in there. This came out in psychology. Oh, we can only reduce about 50% of papers. No, oh, we're, we're doing well compared to the pharmaceutical studies, right? Uh, and they're going to talk a little bit more about why we might find these troubles, right? There are a variety of sources for irreproducible results. Errors could hide in their original design execution, or analysis of the data. Unknown factors, such as patients' undisclosed condition in a medical study, can produce results that are not repeatable in new test subjects. And sometimes, the second research group can't reproduce the original results simply because they don't know exactly what the original group did. However, some problems might stem from systematic decisions in how we do science, and this researchers, is, the institutions that was the scientific that method they let out. And the scientific journals that publish findings are expected to produce big results frequently. Important papers can advance careers, generate media interest, and secure essential funding. So there's slim motivation for researchers to challenge their own exciting results. In addition, little incentive exists to publish results unsupportive of the expected hypothesis. That results in a deluge of agreement between what was expected and what was found. In rare occasions, this can even lead to deliberate fabrication, such as in 2013 when a researcher spiked rabbit blood with human blood to give false evidence that his HIV vaccine was working. The publish or perish mindset can also compromise academic journals' traditional peer review processes, which are safety checks where experts examine submitted papers for potential shortcomings. The I'll give you another example of this. So I serve on the editorial boards of three of the journals in my field. And one time there was a journal we peer reviewed, uh, a submitted article. We raised concerns like you do with everything you peer review. Um, and when they made changes, we ultimately accepted it. And then they came back to us and they were like, guess what? We made up all that data. And it's like, Okay, we can find things like your method was weird. We can't just know you made up your data, right? When you submit something, we're assuming you did it in good faith. Like, there's no way for me to just go, mm, oh, they made this up, right? If <laughs> the data look like any other data, right? How am I supposed to know unless someone tells me? And so this is a real problem for psychology, for scientists in general that, you know, if people are not approaching the fields with good faith, then that's where the problems come in. And it's really hard to catch those. The current system, which might involve only one or two reviewers, can be woefully ineffective. That was demonstrated in a 1998 study where eight weaknesses were deliberately inserted into papers, but only around 25% were caught upon review. Many scientists are working toward improving reproducibility in their fields. There's a push to make researchers' raw data, experimental procedures, and analytical techniques more openly available in order to ease replication efforts. The peer review process can also be strengthened to more efficiently weed out weak papers prior to publication. And we could temper the pressure to find big results by publishing more papers that fail to confirm the original hypothesis, an event that happens far more than current scientific literature suggests. This is actually, it has a name we call it the file drawer problem in science, where because things that find significant findings are much more likely to be published, um, if you don't find what you hypothesize, a lot of times you don't even bother to try to get it published. You just sort of, you know, put it in your now probably like junk file on your computer. But once upon a time, you literally shove it in a file drawer and be like, well, can't do anything with that. Um, and obviously, that doesn't advance science, right? Because it's entirely possible there isn't a relationship. Science always has and always will encounter some false starts as part of the collective acquisition of new knowledge. Finding ways to improve the reproducibility of our results can help us weed out those false starts more effectively, keeping us moving steadily toward exciting new discoveries. Alrighty, so part of what happens in science and really in everyday life is 
what's published, what's believed, has a lot to do with how confident we are in our own beliefs. So not even thinking about science, but just your beliefs in general. What do you think determines how confident you are and how much you believe something? Yeah. Um, like, you know, I Exactly. Yeah. And oftentimes uh, we call this lived experience, right? That like if you have experienced it yourself, then you're going to believe it because you've had it. Whereas it's so silly, but people who are of sort of like up the chain CEOs, things like that, will be like, that can't have happened because they've literally never had that lived experience, right? What do you mean there are my employees who can't afford to eat? I can eat, right? And so sometimes people get really out of touch with what's happening to other folks. And that empathy or positioning taking is really important. Other thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> right, same. Um, and so part of what happens is whether you want to dig in your heels uh, or whether on this particular topic you might be more open to learning something new. Yeah, and this can be a big issue um, where scientists can be like, that can't be true. And in fact, we find out on the road, oh, it is true, <laughs> right? I mean, Galileo was executed because it was considered heresy that he said the earth went around the sun. One of my favorite Galileo quotes, I'm going to have to paraphrase it because I don't remember the exact wording is that. I do not believe the same God who's endowed us with sense and reason has intended us to forego their use, right? <laughs> like, we were given these abilities for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it relates back to what we talked about on Friday from being in ethical chambers or our own bubbles where everyone around us is saying the same things, right? Then if someone presents us with something about the opposite, we might be like, well, but I've never heard that. How can that be true? <laughs> so there are two general points here for science. Uh, one thing we're looking in science is the amount of evidence. Um, so the more evidence, the more studies are coming to the same conclusion, the more that we feel like we can trust those results, right? But we have to test it and we can't just trust one study. Uh, even within psychology for therapies, you know, we want to use therapies that work and we want to implement them right away. I can't remember if it's like four or five, you need like four or five randomized control trials where you've compared the therapy to something else and it works better for it to be considered a therapy that works, right? And so that might be frustrating because those might take years, right? But we don't want to do something that's actually going to harm people, right? Um, and then it doesn't match up with other scientific beliefs, maybe within our field, maybe within other scientific fields. When you're just chatting with somebody in day-to-day -day life, casual conversation, what does it mean if someone says, I have a theory? Yeah. An idea. An idea. Yeah. So people kind of think of it as I have an idea. This is my, I would say it's more, the way we use the word theory is more like hypothesis in science. Yeah. But the scientific definition of theory is a way of understanding a body of information and explaining related facts. So it's very much based in let's do research, let's analyze. It's not just, shooting something off the top of my head, right? And I think that this language distinction is one of the reasons why lay people often struggle to understand science as categorically different than like how we theorize in day-to-day -day life. Like the theory of evolution, well, that's just a theory, so whatever, right? Whereas it's instead this way of understanding information with a whole body of research behind it that's forever growing, right? And so then a hypothesis, which again, like, is more what we think of in lay terms, uh, but is much more specific even in science, it's a speculation, an educated guess, a prediction. These are what drive scientific research, 
So at the beginning of every study, you need to come up with at least one hypothesis. Depending on how complex your study is, you might have multiple. Um, I did a study with my site creative research students in the spring that I think we ended up having like 10 hypotheses for because we were looking at a bunch of things of how they are related. And that's fun. But the hypotheses themselves should be based on existing theory, right? And that can be as overarching as like the theory of evolution, or it can be really specific. So one of the theories I use is called objectification theory. That's the idea that it was originally developed for women, but it really applies to people of all genders. That if you see people of your gender, people who look like you, constantly used as objects in advertising or on TV or in movies where, you know, there are ads where it's just people's torsos, they don't have a head, right? And again, at the time they developed this in the 90s, it was much more common to see that with women's bodies, but now we're seeing it a lot with men's bodies too, and going into non-binary and trans individuals. So that's a very specific theory, but it informs a lot of the work that I do in terms of media influence and body image dissatisfaction. So there are controversies or ideas that have a large body of research support. I mentioned evolutionary theory already, so let's start with that one. Why do people push back against the theory of evolution? Yeah, yeah religion. You know, it's really interesting because it depends on your religion. Sometimes it depends on like the sect or even the church in your religion, how much people are, I mean, one of my best friends from college is a Catholic, but a biologist, right? So <laughs> you can reconcile the two, um, right? But other people will be like, we didn't come from monkeys. It's like, no, we had monkeys came from a single ancestor, right? Somewhere down the road. Hey, right. what about this idea that vaccines cause autism? Why do people not believe that that isn't true? Why are people still like, don't get vaccinated, it'll cause autism? Yeah. Well, the entertaining fact is that there are people who play the Amish and say, well, they don't get vaccines, their kids don't have autism. And the Amish population in the US is about 100,000, and we have two kids for every little bit as a proportion of the population. It's consistent to the average of the US. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, I love and admire the Amish, but not to mention all the sort of genetic diseases they have, because unfortunately, because there's only 100,000 of them, you end up with closer relationships that are varying than we would really expect. Yeah, yeah, that's such a good point. Um, so one of the reasons why, it goes back to what, again, we talked about on Friday, we're going to keep like, referring back to things we talked about throughout this class, the idea that it's really hard to change a decision or an idea once we have it set in our minds. And there was a study that came out, I believe in the 1970s, where this guy said, vaccines cause autism. And he had what looked like good data to back it up. Well, in the 1990s, early 2000s, I think, um, one of the British newspapers actually investigated this because someone kind of tipped them off. Uh, and this guy had fabricated people's medical records. He said, they, their autism symptoms appeared right after they got the MMR vaccine, when in fact the symptoms in the record started before him. My favorite is at his own child's birthday party, he took blood samples from all the children without their parents' consent. Like, you get a party favor bag, get a blood sample. Uh, no, that's not ethical, right? Um, and the greatest part about him is that he was not anti vax initially, he was trying to help create a new MMR vaccine that he would then be able to make money off. And so that's why he was trying to discredit the existing one. And yet this is still in our vernacular. People still believe this, even though the study has been retracted by the medical journal, The Lancet, who like, it was not retracting, so much was absolutely necessary. Uh, and even studies funded by anti-vax groups have found no link between autism and vaccines, um, but it remains. Another thing that we've seen lately is this idea that like COVID was never real, COVID was made up. Um, I think some people, this is like wishful thinking, right? Like people were like, oh no, that didn't happen. 
Um, and he's kind of tied together, right? Like horror stories of people who are anti-vax being put on ventilators in the hospital and being like, can I get the vaccine now? But unfortunately, it's too late, right? At this point in time, we're just trying to keep you alive. Uh, COVID is real, COVID is dangerous, COVID is still around. Unfortunately, we do have protections from our vaccines, right? Um, but vaccines do not, I think this is another misconception, vaccines do not mean you won't get it. They just mean if you get whatever disease it is, it won't affect you in the same way. Uh, so like, for example, my 92 year old grandfather is like, well, I got COVID even though I had the vaccine. I don't believe in that. And I was like, yeah, but you're still here. Right? So like, you are medically frail. So had you not had the vaccine, you would not still be here. And we're very great that you did it. Um, and so again, I think part of this is that echo chamber. People get stuck in and who they hear things from and along those lines. All right, we'll have a few more slides from this lecture that we'll finish up on Wednesday. And then we'll start diving in to looking at sense versus nonsense as well.